<laughs> to Mouthful with Marissa Pitts. Please take a moment to love, like, and subscribe right now. Very excited to bring on today's guest, and let's bring her in right now. It is Bridget Murnane. She is the producer and director of award-winning documentary, Bella, a documentary about the life, influence, and impact of California-based artists and activists, Bella Lewitsky. All right. Hello. How are you doing, Bridget? Good. How are you? You look oh. good. <laughs> oh, thank you. You too. You too. Thank you. I've just been enjoying this gorgeous morning. A little bit overcast, but it is fabulous SoCal yes. weather. Mm -hmm. okay. So before we jump into the conversation, right? I know some of our listeners have not had a chance to check this documentary and we have the trailer and I do want to play it. Great. Set the tone. All right. This is a trailer for the award winning documentary Bella that is currently streaming on PBS for free. Bella Lewitsky was a remarkable dancer. Bella was iconic, a legend. To me, she was like a goddess. I mean, my God, Bella could balance on a dime. She was always intensely, incomparably magnificent. I am what is called a modern dancer, a term which describes exactly nothing. It, it only tells you that it is not ballet. Bella is important because she created a company here in Los Angeles where there is no dance. There was a formal elegance in her work, but a kind of political power also underneath. Are you now, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party of the United States? You were summoned and you made the deathless remark to the committee, <laughs> I'm not a singer, I'm a dancer. Is that That's, correct? Uh, that happens to be true, yes. Censorship is obscene. One of the biggest names in the world of dance is putting her foot down against censorship. I decided that I could not, in good moral conscience, accept the fact that a trampling on the rights of the First Amendment was good or even legal. There were many things about the way Bella made work that had a different kind of power to them, knowing what she had gone through as far as just being able to make art the way you want to make art. There is such a thing as to live, and that is food, shelter, clothing. And then there is such a thing as why do you live? And that is art. Congratulations, this documentary. Thank you. Really. Uh, when you reached out to me, see, I was like, of course, um, you know, I went to Cal State LA where we were a faculty there, was able to come in as an adjunct faculty um, working directly with the, the institution of Cal, uh, Cal State LA. So when you reached out to me, I was like, of course, let me look at this. Bridget, I love you. Let me see. <laughs> wow. Okay. I first started watching it and I was telling, I mean, we talked about this, listeners, I am telling you, when I first started watching it, I was like, cool, I'll kind of start, so it felt like it was going to be long. I was like, it's going to be it's almost an hour and a half. I was like, whoo, in these day and ages where anything more than 30 minutes, I'm like, all right, I hope this is yeah. good. So I started kind of watching it and I was a little distracted and immediately about 30 minutes in, I was like, I have to stop and come back yeah. to where I'm going to have no distractions and I can just watch. Right. Because sometimes I'll flip through things, the documentary, like, oh, okay, while I'm cleaning. And I was like, no, came back, started it from the beginning. And, you know, I use the words, you know, it was riveting. And I saw another critic use those same words. And I think it's, it's because it's so apropos. I couldn't turn it off. 
Right? I even had to go back and rewind on some part because you're using original audio, right? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it, it muffles. I was like, oh, no, no, oh, no, no, what'd she say? What'd she say? <laughs> and I had to bring it back. And I just want, um, you know, I don't want to give anything with phone people to really come and watch this. Mm -hmm. but, but why, Bella, what, what was it in, in her life that you're like, I need to tell her story? Um, well, I was her student. Um, and I was a dancer um, when I was younger, and I actually studied with her student, Susan Rose, when I lived in Boston, and she went to Cal Arts when Bella was there. So I met Bella in 1978, her husband, the company, you know, and I studied with her in a lot of workshops. It, anybody who ever met Bella, especially anybody who studied with Bella, you were just captivated by her. I mean, she had such a presence about her. And um, I always knew, well, I didn't know I was going to be a filmmaker. I was getting a master's in dance at UCLA and somebody said, come up to the film school and help us with a shoot. You know, so I ended up going up there and getting an MFA in film. And when I started in that program, I remember thinking, I have to make a film about Bella. I have to make a film about oh. Bella. And that was like okay. in the 80s. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, and, and, and I think especially now, um, she really is such an important figure for people to know about um, because as, you know, things go in cycles and we're going into yet another cycle about censorship right now. Um, and I always say that making this film was my political act yeah. because I really felt it was important for her to be in the discussion of what's going on now. Yeah, and I think one of what absolutely shocked me, I mean, is that no one really knows who Bella Lewitsky is. Mm -hmm. I heard of her name. I'm from obviously from SoCal, right? So mm -hmm. I've heard of her name. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm I am a theater major, right? I have my MFA. Um, so mm -hmm. I her name has been brought up. I'm not a dancer, so a lot of the dance um pioneers right i know the name and then a little bit about them and that's it like merce cunningham right so stuff like that where you hear i'm like okay i can, mm -hmm. I can have a conversation um but i didn't realize that she was pivotal in our freedom to create art that mm -hmm. i have the luxury of today mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right so um, i know that it was in 1990 bella rejected a seventy-two thousand dollar grant from the national endowment for the arts in protest over the anti-obscenity provisions in the endowments grant guidelines right um, mm -hmm. and a lot of that saying is it was obviously geared um, against people from the lgbtq community right because you mm -hmm. can have anything that showed homosexuality mm -hmm. applied towards any indecency Right, mm -hmm. and in such a broad term, right, that it would depend on whatever the government decided mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they would like you to show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it, it's really funny because at that time period, 1990, I was working at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston. I was the assistant video curator, and we showed the Maplethorpe show. Oh. Um, and I was all also doing work for the Coalition of Freedom of Expression, and I was running around interviewing constitutional lawyers and, you know, but we got bomb threats, oh you God. know, at the museum. I remember having these staff meetings and they'd bring us all in and say, don't tell anybody, but, you know, we're, we're getting bomb threats. I mean, it was very serious. So I was sort of in the middle of all that while that was going on. Um, and yeah, I mean, Bella as we talk about on the film, it really goes back to her previous experience being blacklisted in the fifties. Mm -hmm. um, and she just said, when this happened in 1990, it brought her right back to her experience in the fifties. Yeah. So, you know. And, and, I, and I find it interesting because other companies at that time had turned down um, the grant. They were like, nope, we're not going to take it. But it, it, from, from what I was reading in the different papers and stuff, mm -hmm. she was really the only one to nationalize, yes. to bring in the press mm -hmm. to say, look, mm -hmm. not only am I turning this down, but let me tell you why, because it does harken back, right? Mm -hmm. so in 1951, when she was subpoena testify in the House of Un-American Activities Committee, right? It's a very long word, H-U-A-C, mm -hmm. uh, right? Uh, you know, all the, the anti-American, right? Yeah, to act, we're all, we're all there. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um and and her having to testify and i love that you put in the thing you know um 
Uh, I, I'm a, I'm a, I, I don't sing. I'm a dancer. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a dancer, not a singer. Yeah. I'm a dancer, singer, right? Uh, yeah. And I love, and I love that thing about her showing that, you know, like, like you had just mentioned at the top of the show, we tend to go in cycles with our government about mm -hmm. trying to keep art suppressed and mm -hmm. the freedom of art, because art, if it's done through civic engagement, right? As long mm -hmm. as they can control what the narrative is and what the mm -hmm. populace has, then it's mm -hmm. okay. But if, if that if the art starts to question, which art does question, art's supposed to question. Mm -hmm. You're supposed exactly. to walk out being like, <laughs> hey, <laughs> what's, my, what's going on with my life? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe make us think. <laughs> think and discuss and conversate, right? Yeah. I always, yeah, I always tell my um, students when I was taught, I was teaching the um, intro to world history, it was like in 16 weeks, I had to do 2,500 years of, of theater <laughs> around the globe, you know, because it's just so easy. <laughs> um, it's a, a joke, let me tell you. Uh, but it was, it was one thing I always talked about is there's a reason why you'll see a lot of money thrown into comedies, I feel. Mm -hmm. Not satirical comedies, mm -hmm. but comedies because our, the, the powers to be don't want us thinking. Right. They want exactly. us to go to work laugh and get it out right the catharsis aristotle get it out and then go back and do your civic engagement mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah sit back in your lounge chair yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's it <laughs> pop open that bud light all right <laughs> yeah but we're advertising during the comedy <laughs> yeah. exactly. exactly and i feel that with dance and i like your thoughts on this you know we i feel like what are your thoughts on dance being that 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 vehicle for people to stop and think right because i know the mm -hmm. lot of when we see dance we go oh okay there's our ballet or oh, okay that's a you know the the thing that we, we you know that is a tradition that we see but mm -hmm. you know she was a, a modern dancer mm -hmm. right and and for mm -hmm. what what do you feel that like a modern dancer is in our culture for us well as a now <laughs> I don't think we now they call it contemporary mm -hmm. when when people say modern dance, it kind of goes back like people think Martha Graham and Merce Cunningham mm -hmm. and, you know, all of that. And what's so interesting about Bella is that, you know, she's from here and she worked with Lester Horton and helped develop his technique. But what they were doing was really based on Native American dance. Okay. And I think a big problem we have in this country is that dance is not part of our culture. Um, we don't think it's part of our culture. And in many places, dance is just part of everything. So it's not a big deal. Like when, I would say the word dance, I swear people would turn around and run away. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm making a film about a dancer. I couldn't say that because you know, yeah. people in this country are really not educated about dance at all. And it's not part of their lives yeah. on a daily basis. And I think of all the art forms, it's the one that people know the least about. And it's also the most ephemeral of art forms as well. So you really need to go see it and see it live. Yes. Um, you know, so yeah, defining like today, modern dance. I don't think it exists anymore. I think, you know, I think it's called contemporary and it's evolved, which is Bella was very behind things evolving and not staying static. You okay. know, I asked her once, like, do you remember the Horton technique that you developed with him? And she looked at me and said, no, I don't remember that. He believed things should evolve. And I do too. Mm -hmm. And that was Bella. Yeah. And I think you, you capture that also in the documentary um, with her daughter. Oh, with right. Nora. Yeah. Yes. And um, I think, you know, it, there was a moment in there where she, as any protege does, they question the teacher. Yeah. They, 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 you're supposed to. <laughs> like if you're yeah. not questioning yeah. who's teaching you, their teacher's not doing the right, their job. Mm -hmm. um, and her daughter had felt she was stuck in her ways a little bit and mm -hmm. wanted to mm -hmm. expand her wings, went out to New York. And I think it's a testament like said dance is a direct reflection of our culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet we're so removed from it. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. We see we see it getting cut all the time into some universities. Cal State of L.A. Yeah. When yeah. I was there, dance program gone. Well, and you know that that was the first place that Bella performed with her company in 1966. Oh, at Cal State L.A. Yes. Oh, I did not. Okay, I did not know yes. that. 
And it's the last place she performed with her company in 1997. Oh. They had a huge gala at the Luckman. But she was asked in 1966 by Pat Fino, who was then the head of the dance program, to um, reconstruct some Horton pieces. And Bella said, I didn't really want to do that, but I could make some new stuff. So she formed a company and she made five pieces in a couple of months. And Cal State LA was the first place that she performed. And they often did workshops there and residencies. And so Cal State LA was really a, an important part of Bella's history and, and dance history in Los Angeles. And now the dance department. And it's gone. And it's yeah. gone. I mean, that's, that gets to me is heartbreaking. It's, it's in the film, you talk about her um, breaking ground and, and her mm -hmm. vision of bringing dance to LA. Mm -hmm. residencies where we, people can go and I my daughter wants to be a dancer it like breaks my heart <laughs> okay um when I have my daughter I start crying I'm like ah um so she is she wants to be a dancer mm -hmm. right I I literally can't afford to put her in classes mm -hmm. right so I'm looking at I work a lot and I'm trying to figure out and they're so expensive yeah right? you know yeah. and I'm just like how do I how do I budget you know and I'm going to I'm gonna get her and I'm gonna you know if I work a couple mm -hmm. more hours I'll do what I do as a parent but I'm just like you know, when I was watching that documentary, you know, she's showing her daughter dancing and growing up with it and mm -hmm. her vision mm -hmm. to bring what I want for my daughter to mm -hmm. L.A. is a parking mm -hmm. lot. <laughs> it's, and it's a food court. And a food court. Oh, don't forget the food court. <laughs> it's like to eat there. <laughs> it's a parking lot and a food court next to Mocha. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so now when I'm there, I'm going to dance on that on that area. <laughs> You should. You should. I am. I really am. Sorry, as I cry. Anytime I, I, I get emotional. So no, it's I'm true. I'm an emotional person. Um, yeah. Dance brings. I think, and I think what's beautiful is dance, theater, arts. It brings out our emotion. It brings out our humanness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Exactly. And kids, especially because they're so physical and so in their bodies. You know, I mean, Bella actually was in the first program that brought dance to the public schools. It was called Impact. And um, she went into the schools in the Glendale Public Schools. And her thing was, let me work with the teachers and have them just incorporate movement all day long to show them ways that they could do that. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Because you have to have something that's sustainable. You can't just come in one day. It's like right. feeding somebody a fish, you're going to feed them for a day. But if you don't teach them how to right. fish, they're going to starve tomorrow. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So that that was one of her things that she did. That yeah. was very forward thinking. And I find, uh, what are your thoughts on why is LA a, a desert, as they say, when it comes to dance? I mean, we well, have, we're obviously television, film. I mean, we're, we're known for that Mecca theater. We got our spots, Center Theater Group, and we have that for community outreach. But when it comes to dance, during her time, I mean, she's, she's the first company really mm -hmm. to form in in los angeles as based out of los angeles comes from all the um, from the dancers in that pool why isn't there more then well you know there is a lot but i think word doesn't get out about it there are a lot of companies in los angeles and companies that are really quite good um and but i think that the general public just doesn't get the information about them. Um, and I do think right now that LA is going through kind of a renaissance. There actually was an article in the New York Times last month, okay. um, which I had to correct because they didn't mention Bella and they did correct it. Oh, but really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, awesome. It, it, it's, I think it's this thing about West Coast dance that because yeah dance everybody thinks it's from new york and from mm -hmm. the east coast it it's still to this day is like this renegade outpost of dance but i think um if you go to places like the dance resource center if you read the la dance chronicle um there's a lot of places that you can go and find out about what's going on right now because Okay. It really is not a desert. It really is happening and going on, but it doesn't have the same platform that theater, art, you know, sculpt has. Um, yeah. So I think that's the issue with LA more than anything else. Is there anything that you feel um, that we as a community can do, other than obviously looking, you know, trying to support and trying to look for it, mm -hmm. but trying to get our our government right our our universities our stuff to invest in dance because we're not seeing it we're seeing them invest in social media we're seeing them invest in the new cutting yeah. here how do you how do you edit a video how do you edit a video right so we're seeing which is great i i i i use it right 
but I, I find the foundation of dance is is every university it's now getting combined and it's shorter and smaller and smarter so smaller so what can we do as a community to to try to influence a better change to get institutions to continue to recognize dance well i think part of it is that we need to recognize dances in our everyday lives and we need okay. to recognize things like editing is choreography so if you train somebody oh. to be a dancer you're going to they have all these skills already and I remember when I first started working on shoots at, up at the film school, the first time I went, they put me on like a camera in a three, you know, three camera studio. Yeah. And on the first break, somebody said, oh, how long have you been doing camera? And I'm like, a half an hour. You know? <laughs> but, and they were shocked because I was able to follow people. I knew what people yeah. were going to do. Um, and, and everybody was very impressed on how I could pick up heavy stuff. And I'm like, I pick up people all the time. Like, this is absolutely nothing, you know, but there's so many skills. I love that. that. <laughs> I pick up people. What's the camera box? And that's no big deal. <laughs> In those days, believe me, the camera boxes were huge. You know? <laughs> um, but yeah, there was, and that's what happened to me. I realized how many skills I had mm -hmm. and that I learned that were in my body and in my brain that I could use and apply to these other areas. And I really think that's the way people should be thinking and starting with children, definitely, because by bringing them into dance, you're gonna prepare them for so many other things. And I think that's what institutions have to recognize. For some reason, they have put dance over in this corner Mm -hmm. And as you said, now they're getting rid of the dance departments and they're trying to combine it with other things, but not, why not keep the dance department and bring other things into that, yeah. you know, and then collaboration because that's what it's all about. Yeah, I agree. And I know that like universities are, are, are trying to figure that out, right. As I go through, I know Cal Poly Pomona, um, I adjunct mm -hmm. there. Um, that's a, a struggle they're trying to do, mm -hmm. which is that I know their dance community got really vocal. Mm -hmm. They try to just smush them into theater. And right. um, my my mentor, Linda Basesti, who I love, mm -hmm. she was like, they are two different aesthetics and they both need to be recognized yes, as two exactly. different aesthetics. And you exactly. cannot mush us together. We can choreograph, we can collaborate, we can build, yeah. but we are not one. Right, exactly. You know? It's like, you know, dancers really can't dance on a floor that's made for theater. Bella talks about yeah. that in the film. They'll destroy their bodies. They have to have a whole different facility. Yeah. And even trying to go into a dance, I know for when I've, I've done some theater pieces in a dance studio, we have to not have on our shoes. Like you're not right, like, right. like the simple aspect of, oh, I'm just going to turn on the light. Like, yeah. no, 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 no. You cannot have your shoes on. Like, yeah, like, exactly. Take them off at the door. <laughs> yes. It scruffs up immediately. And, and, and people don't realize how delicate that is. And if you're rolling on the ground and, and it, it can cut yourself, right? You get splinters. I mean, there's mm -hmm. so much that come into it. So having those two dedicated spaces. Uh, was there, when, when we're going in, when, you're, when you started to decide you wanted to make this documentary, mm -hmm. what were some of the challenges that you faced that you were able to like overcome that you could share to listeners who do want to make a story? Right, but don't know where to start. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. Um, oh, there were many <laughs> obstacles to overcome. The first one's probably the budget, dealing with the okay. budget and getting the money and doing the fundraising. And because we did not receive any grants for this film, mm. um, I was lucky because I was teaching at Cal State LA, so I could use the facilities there, you know, the sound stages and, mm -hmm. you know, a former student was the DP and a lot of my students um, worked on it. You know, remember I ran the internship program there and a couple yes, of Yes, and helped me. Yes. <laughs> I, got, right. I got Bridget, I was like, Bridget, help, I, I have to work. <laughs> I, I can't do free stuff, so help, help me, where do I go? <laughs> oh yes, I used to get a lot of those phone calls. Um, but. It's, it's, you know, I, I think what happened with me is, um, you know, I was, I taught people how to make films for 28 years. Mm. And the problem for me was, but I wasn't able to make my own films because I didn't have the time and I didn't have the money. Mm -hmm. Basically, I knew how to do it. And it really is something where you need to learn the stuff that, you know, you need to know stuff before you, you make a project like this. And I was ready. I mean, I'm 70 years old. <laughs> You know, and it's fabulous. And well, thank you. And I was like, if I don't do this now, it's just never going to happen. So I just had to figure out 
with the, what I had in front of me, how I could do it. And um, the other part is I had a fabulous editor, Alex Bush. Um, and that's one thing, you know, the producer does really is you really have to bring in very good people. Uh -huh. um, and people that you can work with, people who have no ego issues or any of this stuff. And that's one thing that I did. I did start with, um, I have a friend who's a very good writer, Pat Reducci, and she came in initially and did a script, but it was more like a timeline script. Okay. Um, and then um, Alex, the editor, actually got a co-writer credit because with a documentary, especially when you go into the editing room and when you discover new material, you know, almost mm -hmm. every day, things are going to change. Yeah. And I think that's a good thing. Um, and so now actually people are really advocating for editors and documentaries to get co-writing credits. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I think that's important. And it, and it's huge because it, it shapes the story. Yes. Um, yes. It, it can make a film drag mm -hmm. or you lose the story too. Yeah. Right? So I mean, it can go, you cut too much, you edit too much, and then I'm mm -hmm. lost. Mm -hmm. Or if you don't do it enough, it's like, is this ever going to end? Yeah, no, it's, you know, and the other important thing is to get feedback when you're at various okay. stages. You know, I mean, we brought people in, big documentary people mm -hmm. um, at certain points. And we had, like, the June before I fin we finished it, we had a good, like, biopic, you know, okay. and all the stuff was there. The timeline was there. It was all. And I looked at it. And I was like, it's so boring just so boring and our our co-writer pat said well why don't you just throw it against the wall and put it back together again and i was yeah. like i know what that means because i also learned yeah. composition from bella uh -huh. and you know she had this whole thing about chaos and order yeah and okay. that's literally what we did we kind of just pulled it apart ripped it apart um put various versions you know i did a version and mm -hmm. it was a whole thing and i remember i kept saying to alex this isn't it. Like, I don't want you to use this version. And then once he got that, he was like, oh, and he made another version. And that was the basis for what you see now. Got you. It's, yeah. it's fabulous. Was there something that ended up on the cutting floor that you wish you could add back in? If you had to do like a director's version, you're like, okay, you know, Tons. is there anything? T tons. I mean, she was also the curator and programmer for dance in the Olympic Arts Festival in 1984. So she wow. brought Pina Bausch to this country for the first time. She brought Sankai Juku. She brought companies from all over the world. It went on for a couple of weeks. Wow. I went to, I actually, I danced in it and I can't remember what, but, um, you know, you just were able to see this global dance that she really wanted to bring to Los Angeles. So I would have loved to have had that section in there, but it would have made a two hour film. Yeah. And we were trying to stick to an hour and a half as much as we could. Yeah. Um, and also she was, um, she taught up in Idlewild. Um, mm -hmm. It used to be called Isomata, Idlewild School of the Arts, and it was part of USC. Now it's okay. a separate it's a private institution, but she was, she started teaching there in 1956 and was the first chair of dance there and was involved with them into the nineties. And I went to a couple of summer programs up there and they were just incredible. I mean, you were dancing, you imagine dancing in nature outside oh. with parachutes oh. above you. And I mean, it was just wow. amazing. So, but I tried to, incorporate as much footage of Idlewild as I could. Mm -hmm. So you do see her kind I of- I that. Yeah, and I was really glad you did that because it's one thing, I grew up in SoCal, so I understand the land. I, so when you, when you show these iconic, she talks about, there's something about living in the the, the valley of the Sierra Nevadas, right? Where she, yeah. I, I, I know that feeling, it's in my blood. Right. It's not yeah. just a picture I see. Like I, I know what she's talking about. Um, yes. you know, my I, I grew up in Mount Baldy, right? Oh, I, yes. Okay. Right. So, you know, it's it's a nature is transforma transforming. It mm -hmm. really is, versus that concrete jungle. And she I know you talk about that in the or you you show in the documentary where she talks about there is a different aesthetic from mm -hmm. people who grew up in nature, mm -hmm. how they how the connection between their body. Mm -hmm. um, and movement. I find that fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It's that whole idea. I mean, you know, she was born while her family lived at Llano del Rio, which mm -hmm. is a utopian 
socialist colony in the Mojave Desert. So, and I've been there, I went there to, and there's still ruins of it wow. there. It's quite fascinating. Um, but it is, it's like right in the Mojave in the high desert and you just see the Sierra Nevadas there. Mm -hmm. And then they went and lived in Highland uh, on a chicken ranch. Her father had a chicken ranch and it's the same thing. It's like, you know, you have these big, huge, yeah. and she loved the desert. She loved heat. See, I, I, that's where she lost me. By the way, that's where she lost me. I was like, "Ooh, I'm a water girl." No, she was like, "Well, she was a water girl too. She liked water, but she just loved to bake in the sun, you know." Yeah. She, you know, I mean, she grew up there before there was air conditioning. Or, yeah. You know, and, and, and I, and that's why I was like, "Ooh, I drive through the Mojave Desert. I'm like, I, I'm air conditioner blasting. I'm like, don't break down, don't break down, don't break exactly. down." Exactly. Exactly. So I could only imagine what it was like then, you know. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, the, the time I am in my life right now where I'm doing a lot of reflecting on um, on life, right? Mm -hmm. The struggles, like I'm not where I thought I'd be at this age, mm -hmm. right? I mean, in so many different aspects, I'm much further than I thought I'd be at this age. Mm -hmm. um, I've survived a lot of things. And I feel that one thing that kept resonating through this documentary is her love of life, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And 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 it's, and, it, and it, you really were able to capture that because mm -hmm. um, I, I I never met her right but I I, I see this film and, and the way she speaks about her being present mm -hmm. and as she got older too what that meant right the like mm -hmm. how as, as youth can't even understand this sense of being mm -hmm. in in the moment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. really in the moment yeah yeah because you, you and I find this happening to me now. You know, that I'm 70 and, you know, in a way, I mean, I would have, have liked to make this film earlier, but I could not have made this film earlier. I had to be where I am now um, to make this film. And I can understand when she says that because you don't have the anxieties, you know, some things you're yeah. just, they're just not that important anymore. You know, so yeah. I sleep like a rock. <laughs> They say old people don't sleep. I'm like, God, because I don't know. I, I didn't sleep for like 30 years, but now I just feel like, you know, I'm doing what I want to do. I am yeah. who I am. And if people don't like it, well, too bad. I mean, that's yeah. just the way. And I, I'm making what I want to make. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm really happy right now. I think I'm in a really good part of my life. Mm -hmm. And I think as being an artist all your life, it's, you know, you, I mean, I had no clue I'd ever go into film. I, I really, I didn't even, I never had yeah. expectations of where I would be because I just didn't know. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like first generation college. I was raised by a single woman in the fifties and sixties. So it's like, okay. I took one day at a time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's that, that beautiful part about, um, you know, you have, there's this part in the film that I want to play a clip of that just drew me back and I actually had to rewind it when I was watching it because I was like yes you know I'm all I'm fascinated with I want to be in philosophy before I was a theater <laughs> before yeah. I was an actor I was like into philosophy I, I want to be a, a philosophizer um so uh, I, I I kept I had to keep rewinding this and I have this clip that I want to play so it was in your trailer too so I was like okay Bridget picked up on this so let me okay. let me play this for our listeners there is such a thing as to live and that is food, shelter, clothing. And then there is such a thing as why do you live? And that is art. And I think it's that, like, why do you live? Mm -hmm. And that is art. Mm -hmm. right. what, what does that mean for you, Bridget? Like when you when you heard those words, when you're going through all the archival um, stuff that you had, what was that moment for you? Like, like resonated with you? Well, it's so true. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I just felt like, OK, you know, that's how artists live. I mean, yeah. it's it's art. And I and I wish that that same idea can be brought over just to everybody to realize that, because I, I also think that art is not part of our culture in, in many ways, and it really needs to be. 
And um, again, I think it's something we should be bringing into the schools and doing early on. When I first saw that quote, I mean, I, I, I knew that quote and we start with it at the beginning of the film as text. And I remember saying to Alex, we want to start with text. <laughs> You know, it's like, it's not a Ken Burns movie, you know, and, uh, but then I was like, That's yeah, <laughs> this, is, this is the perfect way to start it because it's really her philosophy of life. Yeah. And so I think, and, and all history has shown that the societies that were in their golden era that flourished, right. That showed mm -hmm. the, the, the best of that society's culture heavily invested in the arts. Mm hmm and their government heavily invested and didn't censor mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and didn't, I mean, your, your government's always going to censor. I mean, like within realm, right. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that, that is, that is, that is civic government. Right. But they, and, and, and whether it was the golden age with Rome, whatever it might have been when the, when our culture sees the value of art and through our children, mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. Having and showing like, Hey, look, this is important because everything we do is so that our kids can grow up, take over and continue on. Right. And live mm -hmm. um, healthy and prosperous. Every parent wants that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I've noticed that when our society veers away from having the freedom of art mm -hmm. and having that, that's the decline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Because then people aren't doing what they want and need to be doing to have a happy life. I mean, <laughs> that's basically it. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. It's, it's pretty simple. <laughs> it, it really is. And it's like, and, you know, and the other thing is that everything has just been so monetized. Yeah. And that's like a huge issue, I think, especially in this country. Yep. I can't <laughs> afford to see anybody I like to see. I'm like, oh, wow, that's going to cost me a dime and a penny. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm exactly. going to wait till I can somehow see you online for free and you can see, you can see Bella for free Bella for free um Bridget where can our listeners find Bridget I'm mean, Bridget find Bella <laughs> they can find where can they Bella find you? and where can they find Bella <laughs> they'll find both of us at pbs.org or you can download the PBS free app mm -hmm. um if you're in Southern California and actually this weekend 15th and 16th it's also on the world channel which is um nationwide and um, if you're a PB, you can check and go to your local PBS um, listings and see if they carry the world channel. But I think most of the times are like four and nine Pacific time today. And then there's a couple of times tomorrow. So the next two days are big opportunities for people to watch it. But also just check your local PBS. Yes. And I also put it on uh, my face. You can't link anything to Instagram. Um, I did put it on my Facebook page over there. So you can go on a right. Marissa Pitt show. Um, I, and also you can go on to um, Bella Lewitsky. What's your Facebook handle? Oh, Bella's film .com. Bell, but No, for Facebook. It's Bella. Oh, film. Bella Lewitsky film. Bella Lewinsky film. Yes. And if you go there, follow the page, everybody follow, 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 and just scroll down a little bit and you'll see um, a link to the PBS. You'll be able to watch the documentary. I was able to keep clicking onto it. So please do that and also leave a review. Okay. Yes. Please. The more yes. word that gets out for stuff like this, um, the, the easier it is going to be to access. And there'll mm -hmm. be people who actually will give funding. Yes, yes. Rotten Tomatoes, IMDb, Letterboxd, we're on everything. Yes. All right. Well, Bridget, thank you so much for coming in, um, sharing this fabulous film about Bella Lewitsky. It's um, definitely a national treasure. When they say she is part of the national treasure, she is national treasure. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, Marissa. I'm so proud of you. Oh, <laughs> Wow. Yes. Amazing. Just amazing. You're going to make me cry again, Bridget. <laughs> Go right ahead. Cry. All right, right. Cry, cry. Well, thank you. Congratulations on your film, on your little puppy. Um, puppy was very good today. We haven't heard her. <laughs> I know. I, sh I, I put tons of treats in her mouth before we started. Now she's just conked out. <laughs> <laughs> love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much. You have a wonderful day, and we'll definitely catch back up again. Okay. Right. Thanks bye -bye. a lot. Ciao. Thank you so much. That was a mouthful. And don't forget, if you love what you're listening to, please love, like, and subscribe. Right now, there is more left on The Marissa Pitt Show.